Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to Tier No of the Last Days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokalever. And right now, an unfortunate reality. You psychopath, you moron, you are absolutely bad word idiot. Valentiv struggles to find the words to describe Andronie Mishrenko, slamming a fist on the desk of companion Galenskov in frustration. Yuri, you've got to recognize this for what it is. Complete and utter S-word. Yuri Galenskov yeah, felt he could trust companion Valentiv. He had always done the best interest of the people, of course. He thought the same of Ivan Stepanov. Companion, you and I have both fought for companion Mishorenko's right to speak and to propose his plans to the assembly. Valentiv brushed back his hair and leaned back in his chair in disbelief. Mishorenko sat erect, his lips curled in a smile. Thank you, companion Galenskov. I appreciate that you can recognize true talent when you see it. Mishorenko shifted in his seat, leaning forward uh, towards Yuri. From my service, I've learned, the intellectuals, they are excellent at sitting in ivory towers, shouting commands down to us. They know nothing of practical warfare. A nuclear weapon is a weapon, just like a rifle or a pistol. We don't ask for the scientists to assemble our artillery, we ask the people. Yuri, not everything is a people's struggle, Valentin pleaded. I implore you to leave this to the experts for the sake of the people. The academia are our companions, too, are. Not everything may be a people's struggle, but this is. And we, my friends, are talking about leading this to the experts. Or, all hands on deck? I think we gotta go all hands on deck, but we'll do that soon enough. Let's do the second test. The Anarchists have won! The war nation was close to becoming the kind of despotic warlord state that many of her neighbors have become. Yuri Galenskov and his supporters managed to organize and beat patch Stepanov's vile coup. With Stepanov out of the picture, a new dawn opens on the Siberian Free Territory. Where we go from here, and what Galenskov does with his newfound power on the Security Council is unknown, and we can only hope that he sticks to the anarchist ideals that would brought us here. With what they can never take away from us. Stepanov want, went to great lengths to muddy the waters on what is anarchism and what isn't. His sweeping authoritarian decrees and actions made our citizens question what anarchism even is. The situation was made worse by the fact that most citizens didn't, and still don't, want to know what anarchism actually is. Our guiding hand, Yuri Galenskov, will make a speech outlining the basic fundamental rights of man and the core tenets of anarchism, hopefully sparking a discussion on the ideology and helping our citizens to understand what the rights are in the free territory, scavenging the ruins somewhere deep in the woodlands of Siberia. Yuri Galenskov wandered. He trembled, his naked body recoiling against the falling snow. He was stripping off all of his possessions save for a singular lantern, radiating a dim light. Above him, a pale white eye watched him from a black starless sky. Without direction or purpose, Yuri stumbled forward. The foreign, forlorn forest swayed in the rigid wind, but Yuri's hair remained still. The air sung a call, uh, sung a song, a call. It was inviting. It felt like home, it felt... Good. The checking stopped. Suddenly, he existed outside of the elements. Snowflakes made their home on his skin, refusing to melt. This was good. He laughed as he dropped the lantern. Yuri kicked snow into the air and danced around as the ice crystals fell to the ground ever so delicately. He spun and twisted and jumped, frolicking deeper and deeper into the woods. The song of the forest grew louder and louder as Yuri's grin grew larger and larger. The song stopped, though. <coughs> The great celestial body watching over him blinked out of existence. The forest was now black, it was more than black, it was a void. It wasn't simply a room with dull light, it was a destroyer of light. Yuri's laughing trailed off as the cold impacted him once more. For years, Yuri standing in the destroyer of light. Without warning, the trees ignited into flame. Yuri began to scream, he began to claw at his skin, it was so hot. Too hot, it was hot. Yuri began to melt his skin, pulling at the ground, it was hot, 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 hot forever. From the ashen corpse of the woods, a single tree grew and on its lone branch dangled a body, fat and round the body shook amongst the flickering flames. Yuri, the corpse thundered. You child, look at what he brought to the forest. Teeming with life, now look, look. Yuri had no eyes to look, but he saw. Yuri jerked himself upright in his bed, panting heavily. He looked around the room as if it was before. He closed his eyes. He began to laugh. It was only a dream. His giggle turned into a laugh and his laugh into a sob. One sleepless night of many. Now here, we got how far to go with our disdain for tyrants and stuff like this. Now, Emancipating themselves looks pretty bad. Army professionalism goes down. No clemency for tyranny. Or tyranny. My friend said tyranny the other day. Tyranny. Ah. How far to go? Jesus Christ. Oh, that looks so bad. Black army in shambles. Oh, good God. Minus 75% attack? Mmm. Empower these guys. Freedom must be protected. Um, disdain for tyrants. I guess we'll do that one next, but we'll go to. I want to go to war with the, um, 
Kazakhs as fast as possible. So, the state is not but a tool for the powerful to beat down the weak. A tool for the rich to steal from the poor. A tool for the hateful to oppress the hated. A tool for the powerful to acquire or accrue more power. As long as such an apparatus exists, the people will su suffer. That is why the Black Army will never accept such a thing. We will reject the fascists, communists, democrats, and all others who advocate for a state, whether big or small. We will fight all those who try to institute their authoritarian ways on us, so our free territory will remain free. And we've got enough political power that I'm just going to go ahead and do this. Hopefully, uh, no one else intervenes, because these guys are still killing each other, which is what, exactly what we want to see. And we're going to integrate another place here. Not much else has really happened, so speaking to a shaken people. Your coat, companion Galanskov, Yevgenia draped Yuri in a coat of bearskin, one too, far too large for a man of his stature. The revolutionary looked straight on his mind elsewhere. Yevgenia circled back from his back and stood in front of him. She strained to find Yuri inside his eyes. His, her face dropped. Yuri, I understand you're torn. She placed her wrinkled hands on his chest. We've come too far right now. You have to speak to them. I know you will. You always have to do the right thing, Yuri. You aren't him. The phrase struck a chord with Yuri, his face twitching slightly. Thank you, companion Taratuta. Yuri pulled the coat tighter around himself as he moved to the door to the balcony. Yuri gripped the doorknob before he even stepped out. Yuri could hear the cheers. They sang his name, demanding to see companion Galenskov, defender of the revolution against the snake general Stepanov. Yuri took a deeper breath in, turned the knob, and stepped out into the brisk morning air. Yuri nodded politely as he waited for the roaring applause to end. It felt different. What, this was the treatment fascists received and Tsars envied. Why was he here? The answer was in the admiration of the people below him. They chose him, they trusted him, Yuri was not to let them down. Companions, he called. Today we passed the second test. With the combined might, we toppled the authoritarian state of Siberia. We have left them battered and bruised, yet we must remain vigilant. It is time to build our own anarchy, free from the state inside and outside our territory. Yuri found his footing, continuing to rally the people to his side as he laid out his, the core message of the anarchist movement. If only for a moment, moment, the weight of the fear lifted from his shoulders. There is too much work ahead. Ah, cutting down that debt. Oh, we have a lot of debt, but we'll get that done soon enough. Now, I'm glad we were able to do this. And that's 70 days, so can we get rid of this in 70 days? Look at that. Our army professionalism slowly begins to wor worsen quite a bit. Oh, in 70 days? Oh, how far to go? I think I'm going to wipe. A communal sphere probably is okay to do. So, let's just do this one. The genius of our communal system is not only the guarantee of political, religious, and economic freedom, but also the unity it provides for a nation. Though our communes are very greatly in size and ethnic or, yeah, composition, we are all united in dedication to the cause of anarchism. Having all lived in the communist system for several years, it is doubtful that there are any among us who would truly wish to return to the barbaric, exploitative, and imperialist governments of old. Let us celebrate the communal spirit, that which has brought us peace and prosperity. Very good, and keep working on better guns. Happy 1970, everyone. Hope you're having a tremendous new year. Ah, disdainful tyrants. Good. After ah, communist spirit. Let's see. We will do, we have seen, failure and persevered. Galenskov will embark on a tour of the free territory in hopes of not only expanding his own horizons, but also in an attempt to connect with the people of these communes. Our citizens are so diverse and widespread that it can be difficult to f get a good view of what the people's opinions and thoughts are. The tour of the nation has proved incredibly popular with the people, with several communes preparing large and elaborate celebrations for his arrival. We've seen failure and persevered. The free territory will survive, and if you'd like to read about better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. We now have innovative industry. Keep your head down, they don't know. Keep your head high, though, and they're not hunting you down. They'll have no way of knowing. Why are they looking at him weird? If they didn't know, why did they pull our children tighter to them as they walked by? Oh, he was scratching again. The armband was always itchy force of habit. Quickly, he stuffed his hands into his pocket, fiddling with the paper in one and the knife in the other. He took a deep breath. It's fine. It's going to be fine. Sashu began to hyperventilate. It was not fine. He saw how the Black Army swept through the east with the brutality of a people scorned. They wouldn't spare any sympathy for him. The people were looking at him again. Sasha stopped in his tracks. He nearly walked right past the office. Afternoon, companion. What brings you in? The general called from the across the room. The man back was to him. He was deep within a filing cabinet. Sasha pricked himself with a blade in his pocket. He had orders. He was always following orders. The man turned around. Can I help you? Sasha shook his head, pushing his weapon deeper into his thumb. Gosh darn it, darn it, darn it. Why would they choose him for this? He didn't know how to send a message. He didn't know what the message even was. Are you, are you Valentine? The puzzled man raised an eyebrow, nodded. Sasha pulled the paper from his pocket. Kill, kill him. Tell him the vase was eternal. Do it, Sasha. Do what you're told to do. The general grew agitated. Who are you? What are you doing here? Do it, Sasha. Do it, you gosh darn failure. N nothing, Mr. Valentine. Wandered in, wandered in by mistake. Oh, there was his no mistake. And people like him may need to face justice for their actions against an innocent individual of the free territories. A place in a place a new emphasis on ruralism. 
While the past, in the past, the General Assembly and military have placed a great deal of importance into the bridging the urban-rural divide in the Free Territory, Gallenskov has come to the conclusion that the said divide actually helps to strengthen the Free Territory. The General Assembly has assumed that a greater level of interconnection between the urban and rural communes would allow resources each are suited to for to spread more easily between the two types of communes. Gallenskov instead argues that such a trade actually works to weaken smaller rural communes. Smaller communes won't need to grow larger if urbanized communes can provide the resources they need, thus by eliminating trade between the two you grow smaller communes to grow larger, or you encourage the smaller ones to grow larger. Basic Jet Fighters, I love it. We're going to immediately try to grab Basic Jet Cast. In my commune, you have getting a smile, placing a hand on Yuri's leg as a vehicle jerked up and down in the bumpy Siberian terrain. You have nothing to be worried about, Yuri, she said with a laugh. This should be right up your alley. Yuri produced a half smile in response. He watched out the window, all of Siberia passing him by. It was so large, Siberia, although one could find populated cities dotting around the land, there was so much that was so empty. So much potential was how he put it years ago, standing in the Konsk Assembly Hall. Yevgenia nudged him, shaking him free of his thoughts. Yuri looked to her and gave a wider smile. You flatter me, Yevgenia. You could teach these people just as well as I could. Sure I could, she patted his leg, but they don't want me, Yuri. They want you. Yuri's stomach churned at the statement. Stepping off the tracks in the middle of the... Iskitim, Iskitim commune. Yuri was not greeted by the usual suspects. People did not rush out to meet him, chant his name, and sing his praises. No, instead, the commune carried on as it always did. Only few even recognized companion Galenskov. Yuri could feel a smile forming. It was no rare. It was so rare just to see anarchy in action, to see people go about their day as they wanted. No restrictions or commands from a central authority. Yevgenia had to ruin it. She called the people around them, asking for their attention. A small crowd, mostly just people curious of the commotion, began to grow around him. Yuri bit his lip to keep his smile in place. Duty calls, he supposed. This was the only, the first commune of many he'd visit. After he had a long month ahead of him, undoubtable. But if he just got to see anarchy in action at every stop, as he did here, it might just be worth it. Companions, what do you know of anarchism? Well, well, you look on this, granting opportunity to the freshly liberated. The far east is full of monarchist status, Nazis, and far, far more. Their wicked ideologies have turned the region into one of the worst in all of Russia. Citizens under constant watch from the government. Police thugs taking what they want and hurting whoever opposes them. And worst of all, people who put... Put people into camps for having different opinions. We must do all we can to help these sorry individuals. We will provide food, water, shelter, and a commune to live in, in time. They will surely become a protective member of society once more, and a living monument to what the state can do for people and to people. And the sh shadow of the valley. Or the shadow of your smiles is a great jazz tune. It seemed to Yuri as if he spat. Uh, the spats inside the economic ministry were most the most petty, stupid things he had witnessed in his admittedly limited experience in administration. Sorting through the letters, he took out at the worst ones. I must say, Vladik, your doubt in Kozino's potential for economic prosperity is simply disgusting. St Stanislav, I will be reporting you to the madhouse if you truly believe that incest Hamlet has any potential beyond starving be during a good harvest season. The economic ministry seemed f laser focused on feuding over exactly which Russian town or city got funding when the answer seemed so clear to Yuri. Why not fund evenly, even in smaller towns? Focusing the limited funds they had on larger cities would only widen a diminished urban-rural gap when, distri when distributing it to smaller towns could give them a much-needed boost. Less, dos less densely populated communes could grow rapidly with just a little boost. Big cities don't need, even need more money to flow into their bureaucratic money holes. I'm so tired of this bad word. Very nice. We are ready to go in. Nice, my friends. I love it. Beautiful. And actually, these 40 combo wits, we don't have any of these guys yet. After this war, we will change them up to be 40 combo wits. Um, I don't want to do this, but we'll probably do this anyways. Because we have a lot of army XP. Look at that. Look at the top of the screen. 75, I think. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. 40 combo with tank divisions are not good enough. We need 80 combo width, but I don't think we can get there. Cool. And when's the next research done? It'll be done in a while. Show them our success. Anarchism has been proven as an ideology. The free territory has been wildly successful in every sense of the word. Our communal economy is booming. Our borders are secure. And the people's rights are protected. However, we are ever conscious of our flaws and invite criticism and discussion of the ideology. We will invite ideologues who aren't in support of anarchism to give us their thoughts on why they don't support it and what else they would argue is a better system. Above all else, we encourage this discussion so that our people and the world at large will see that anarchism is a valid ideology. Both sides of the story, huh? Good, good, good. And let's finally core the last piece of territory here, which only takes literally 65 days, which is actually more than I would have liked, but whatever. Ah, uh, as long as no one else wants to intervene, we're kind of okay. Are we moving in or not? Hmm. Come on, guys, let's go. 
Vamanos. There we go. Now they're moving those chubby little legs. After this, uh, after this, after this. Oh, look at that. Nice. Oh, this was Portugal. Pull back the curtain. Capitalists are nothing more than 21st century Tsarists. A controversial opinion, but one that holds up to scrutiny. They abuse like their predecessors, own property like their predecessors, and kill like their predecessors. And by the same token, capitalists are not more than fascists hiding behind the facade of goodwill. There are many among us today who would balk at that assessment, arguing instead that capitalism is good for the country and would serve to improve the nation. This assessment is most certainly false, as evidenced by the banana republics of Central America or the rejected poor of the U.S. The only true path forward is anarchism, and hopefully people will realize this with the facade of other cure, curl ideologies drawn back. We get more tech. Nice. Both sides of the story. The rules were simple. No attacking on personal matters, respect each other's opinions, and, of course, be civil. The simplicity of these roles left a lot to be desired as anarchists and men of many different political orientations flooded the Novo Sovieres Commune Opera Hall for a night of good-natured debate. Galen Scott sat in the back of the hall watching these debates unfold and du duly noting the good points made by both sides. I understand that Nazi mindset, sir, I really do, but I do not understand how you can support the actions of these men after they have murdered so many and left so many innocent dead in their wake. The fascists gave a smug smile and replied, would you kill for freedom? For anarchy, as you call it? Yes. As would I for my freedom, national liberation. Some will die, but if it means a racially pure utopia, Yep, then it is ultimately worth it. Every death, every child, every child, sir. And sir, have you considered that perhaps race is but a construction? That nationalism is but is but a lie co cooked up by your ancestors? I see you have a mindset of a Jew. Only a fool would deny that certain nations are more superior to others. After all, do Africans yet have a Volkshalle? The anarchists scoff, the debate continued. The Jews, I tell you. God, I want a Jewish ethnostate. I want to play as one so badly. I'll be honest, man. I really want to have my Jewish ethnostate. I want to play as one. But, uh, ooh, nice. I was going to say something else. Uh, a lot of fascists are all about that. Ooh, Federalists were going to conquer Iberia. Like, apparently, like, what was it, Mussolini or something? It was like, what was he, assimilationist or something? I don't know. Don't quote me on anything here. I don't know history as well as I probably should. I really have no idea. All hands on deck, though. The struggle for a nuclear weapon is won against the state itself. This crusade we are about to embark on is one of the... One against elitism and controlling nature that the state often imposes on its citizens. The free territory embodies everything that the governments and states around us are not, with true freedom and liberty for its constituent parts. Thus, if we are to embark on the development of nuclear technology and weaponry, we must do so as a whole, drawing experience from all the communes and giving everyone a chance to contribute. We will go from commune to commune and ask for men and women who want to assist in the anarchist struggle for nuclear weapons. I love it. Cut! I think you'll find, Mr. Gallenskov, that could be further from the truth. The suited man bent over to the table adjacent to him, stacks of paper precariously balanced on it. He retrieved one of his many charts and propped it up on the podium before him. He traced a downward slope with his finger. Look here. The general trend of our military industrial capacity has been steadily sliding since we cast away capitalism. It's foolish to disregard the system that brought America from a humble colony to preeminent superpower on the basis of ideology. The packed assembly hall began to throw insults at the speaker, men rising from their seats to heckle the perceived opponent. Yuri Galinskov quickly scribbled something into his notebook, underlying it thrice. With a slam of his palm against the podium, he called the room to order. Now, now, companions, you all convince no one by demeaning them. Yuri leaned against the podium and turned to the man to his right. Now, companion, you make valid criticism of my argument. I acknowledge that. However, I've traveled far and wide around this territory and have seen the impact of capitalism. Let me tell you something. Capitalism works for those who made it, not for those who live under it. Yuri's contemporary had, had his retort, and the revolutionary had his own. The two could have carried on for time eternal, and Yuri would have savored every moment of it. Curtains on capitalism. Followed up with, permit input from all. Well, previously, we have sought the advice of experts and knowledgeable individuals on how to conduct research into this esoteric avenue of technology. We've now realized that widening our scope and asking for the advice of all may be more beneficial for the cause. Advice on administration, metalworking, and industrial production are but a few of the various topics the common people might be able to assist with. Additionally, how could we call ourselves anarchists if we didn't work to include as many people as possible in the process? Interesting. And we have slightly more than half a million manpower in the field, but I'm going to go ahead and start training two divisions here because we're going to need more men and women to fight considering what's happening in the western part of what Russia. Budget-wise, how are we doing? Uh, we can cut some more probably. We can actually, you know what, cut it as well. What, what say you, common man? And let me go and click on this one too. Nice. Uh, 
The General Assembly, as always, was rowdy when Gallon Scarf had called the National Assembly or the Assembly together. Every member of the Congress eagerly set off for Novosibirsk. If they were busy, though few were busy enough to miss an assembly, they brought their deputies in their place. There was electricity in the Congress Hall that seemed to seize every man and woman. They were part of something, something real. Even if it was just some assembly in Siberia, the job life was for the betterment of all men. Probably women. <clears throat> The excited murmur in the hall dimmed to a whisper as Yuri took the stage. Pulling the old microphone closer to his lips and straining his posture, he began to speak to the hundreds gathered. Yuri was never an orator. His voice was uncertain and his cadence stilt 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 styled, stilted. But all of them huddled in the hall understood him, and that was what mattered. I was in my bedroom last night, lying awake and wondering to myself, how does anarchy survive? Truly survive? It is not merely by spirit alone, if it was true. Then what are the countless oppressed who yearn for the spirit of anarchy? What are the theoreticians and the philosophers who wrote book upon book in this ideal? It seems to be clear that men must die for anarchy, for freedom. Whatever it is, statists or fascists or anarchists or themselves, it seems that we must kill the vanguards of a state to achieve lasting anarchy. And I was considering this unfortunate conclusion when I realized it was not from the loins of death that anarchy emerges, but from the fear of death. When the status fear catastrophe, they will leave us to our own devices. When the status fear the ultimate destruction, nuclear, heck fire, they will leave us to our freedom. And so it is the ultimate weapon that will lead us to the ultimate goal or ultimate ideal men. We must build a nuclear device. Ooh, look at this. Project Emancipatia. Wow. Has chosen a different route. Under the guidance of Yuri, the people of Russia will assert themselves as a force to be reckoned with to maintain pr the project's goal of building an atom bomb with the people's help. Yuri will travel from commune to commune asking for the people's input. With the millions of people in Siberia comes millions of differing opinions. Choosing between which advice to take and which to disregard will decide the fate of the project and Russia at large. Oh boy, we actually. Oh wow. That's kind of, kind of wild, not going to lie. And then I'm going to go boom, 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 boom. Just keep building all that stuff there. Uh, yeah, we're, pretty, we're already maxed out, so that kind of sucks. That sucks a lot. What is this one? Visit near Vaknudinsk commune? Norsk commune? Krasnoyarsk commune. All right, interesting. All right, we got both done. Now, let's grab some of that. And let's come back over here. And we got that one done. Let's grab some of this. this Max Factories in State. Yeah, we went with this one. Not, uh, see, this is why I bought that or got those industrial expertise ones. So we can research things, this stuff faster. It's, app, it's already June uh, 1970, so that's not bad. Early cast. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is anyone winning over there? Hmm. Oh, what do we have? Do we core everything first? Hmm. We could visit, but... Hmm. Poverty. I'm going to rush it. I'm going to keep going for this. Four? Oh, there's 11 now? Holy crap. Can we be convinced? No. Uh, let's see. Conv no. Supplies? Yes. So we have 5 versus 10. Militia training? Sure. Novus Abirsk? Militia training? Yes. 7 versus 8. We need one more. So we have 8 communes versus 7. Not bad. Help out the poverty. Gets 3 more civilian factories. Nice. Very nice. <clears throat> From the mines to the labs, there are plenty of miners who work with uranium on a daily basis. Not only do they extract this stuff, but the truckers transport the material, and only then do the scientists get to play with the stuff. These common folk have valuable experience with an element that our scientists are currently uh, having a great deal of difficulty puzzling over. In order to make a bomb, perhaps it might be reasonable to bring them aboard and tap on their knowledgeable handling and working with a radioactive material. Uh, how are we doing here? Like, are we done yet with these guys? I'm not even. I'll be honest, I'm not even paying attention, as you can tell. Like, I know our guys are going to do well here, but, like... Come on, guys. Keep going. Wow. Look at all those tanks we need. <clears throat> we need more rubber, too. Uh, actually, let's go buy some rubber. Why not? Can we trade with the world? Indonesia. We love Indonesia. If there was humor in it, the sign, let your voice ring out through the atom. Yuri finally went off the deep end, or maybe he just jumped in the water long ago and finally pulled down the rest of us to his level. Yuri played fair, though, and you couldn't rag on Yuri too hard when Yuri had dragged himself out of his house to attend the meeting, whether or not, whether out of curiosity or for his entertainment. Yuri took a seat near the back of the tightly packed room, producing a decaying cigarette from his jacket pocket. Yuri let the paper hang carelessly from his mouth as he patted himself down in search of his lighter. An older woman climbed on stage, assisted by some black army hotshot. She hobbled up to the microphone, test, test, are we good? The people recoiled from the feedback. Good, she said cheerfully. I want to extend my, my gratitude for those who came out tonight. This project is of the utmost importance. That being said... <clears throat> I won't take too much of your time. My apologies for this. Uh, I know there's a storm coming in, and so if there's someone who'd like to stay, 
Yeah, I've got something to say, Yuri grinned, looking up at the man who rose to speak. This will be good. Have you considered how entrenched privilege is in war? The construction of atomic weapons is the highest form of classicism. Yuri couldn't restrain himself from laughing hysterically, drawing angry looks from the room. Is there something you find funny about your companion's comment, the elderly woman called on the stage? No, 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 I just... Yuri continued to laugh. He said that nuclear war was classic. I'm just as much of an anarchist as the next guy, but come on, this is just ridiculous. What's ridiculous is that you dragged yourself out of your house, looking as you do, and still have the gall to insult your fellow companions. The woman on the stage retorted. Yuri stopped laughing and slinking back into his chair. What were you saying, companion, before you were so rudely interrupted? And now we can use more political power, so we're going to increase civilian sp spending again. Guys, I know no, not a lot of people want to come to Kazakhstan, but we got to move. we got to keep moving. Wow, these guys look really bad. But just be oh, there goes Iraq. Uh, that's just because we don't have enough tanks. Because we made them 40 combat with. Hey, we're touching them. Boy, of course, we lost less than 1,000. We killed off 32,000 people. Seems fair. Actually, you just go to Octu, Octau. Oh, we have to get political power to core this. To Why am I cutting civilian spending? We need to spend. We need to raise it. And then together, nothing is impossible. Our knowledge has come far. <clears throat> Utilizing the collective knowledge and experience from the millions living in our free territory, we have brought our society to the brink of the nuclear age. Soon, our homes will be powered with clean nuclear reactors and safeguarded by our mighty nuclear bombs. Our anarchist ideology has proven that, without the intervention or guidance of an overbearing state, independent people are capable of anything, even development of nuclear weaponry. Oh, we oh we killed him off. Look at that. Yes, yes. A thousand times yes. Seriously, are these guys killing each other or what? Like, bros, you're taking too long. Um, I'm actually going to build this stuff up first, probably, once we get everything else built. And then we'll go for more civvies. I love civvies. Let's go, we're going to go civvies first. All right, anyways. <clears throat> In my opinion, it is of the most sincere belief that the struggle for freedom has at last reached its climax. Anarchism as an ideology is a fight. It is a never-ending battle against hierarchy. When the people feel secure is when they feel the most vig uh, vigilant. No, that wasn't right. Yuri scribbled the words out. The anarchist struggle is one of unity. The people stand together will be likely, ultimately, victorious over the state when, 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 when... Yuri slammed the book shut. He hated not having the answers. He had to figure it out later. He just needed to. A knock came at the door. Yuri, I was wondering if you had a few moments. Yuri let out a heavy sigh. Yes, please come in. What can I do for you? Well, I, I, well, you know, I was the one to speak my mind. I thought you ought to seriously reconsider this. I'm scared, Evgenia. Is this what you wanted to hear? I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so I let the people handle it. Nobody said anarchy would be easy. <clears throat> Anything worthwhile is not easy. Just, say, just putting that out there. Anything worthwhile is definitely not easy. But that's why we still do it. Cool. So, oh, uh, commune stuff. Love it. Wow, there's so much here. Um, I, I want to do that stuff, but the social international. I'm. I, I got to core more stuff first. I'm going to just going to core more stuff. <clears throat> and when we can, then we'll do like the communes. Power the communes. So we get more political power that way. So now we got to rush the dealing with the snakes in our garden. Though we have rooted out Stepanov and his personal circle of allies, there remains many supporters of him, him or at least his ideas, in the Black Army. In fact, as a whole, the Black Army has become far more authoritarian in status in recent years, taking liberties in the governance and war that would not have been acceptable a number of years ago. We should inform the General Assembly of this fact and work to reform the army because the way the army is currently operating is unacceptable, especially if you want to rush, remain, wish to remain a true anarchist state. Absolutely. Even more artillery benefits. Cut. Good. 9.5 is not bad. Together, nothing is impossible. Now, this is two weeks, but this is going to rapidly get worse. Jesus, this looks so bad. Oh, no. God, no. I'm sorry. I got to do this stuff, too, first, though. And we can go to war in 1971. Green across the board. Yuri sat far, far away from the site. In the middle of the forest clearing was a culmination of months of hard work and the best talent Russia had to offer. Companion Galenskov held a pair of binoculars in his shaky hand. There were many big steps on the way from the Siberian Black Army's journey from the petty band of ruffians to a legitimate community and powerful force in the region. The first deal between him and Stepanov, the wars against the statelets of central Siberia, taking on the status of the East, all of them could have been the moment the whole movement fell apart. This was another one of those pivotal moments he supposed. Companion Galenskov, this is Mishrenko. Yuri deciphered from the static of the walkie-talkie. The weapon is primed. I would hope you are a respectable distance. I would also recommend that you cover your eyes. Even at your distance, you will be most certainly blinded. Yuri trembled as he put the radio into his mouth. 
Understood. Or to his mouth. He said, not allowing his fear to show through the voice. Congratulations, boys and girls. Today, the Russian people have stood up. Three. Yuri ducked under the brick wall he was sitting at. Two. He braced for the sound of the atom splitting. One. He clenched tight, praying that he could trust his companions to provide him with a safe distance detonate. Yuri hugged up against the wall, ready to feel an extreme wave of heat rush over him. There was no bang, no boom, no sound of atom conquered by man. There was silence. Cautiously, Yuri rose from his spot and peeked over the wall to find absolutely nothing. No cloud, no tree flying off in the distance of, from the force of the blast. No, nothing. He grabbed his radio companion, Mishrenko. What uh, just happened? Well, nothing. Seems back to the drawing board. Darn it. Well, maybe we shouldn't have done that one first. Maybe it's best to finish the focus tree and do these ones first before finishing this part of the focus tree. So, that's probably the best thing to do because we're kind of, I was kind of basically rushing down this. Oh, but we do get more political power that way. But we got to do this one first. So, Objection, emancipating themselves. We get more change in libertarian socialism. No clemency for tyranny. Ah, I gotta do this one, though. Oh. So. Objection. Yuri slammed his hands onto the table before him. Sweat drip, dripped from his forehead. Juno Stepanov was a tyrant in disguise, hiding his true intentions deep inside a most treasured institution. Yuri attracted his hands and put them against his chest for emphasis. I was fooled. We were fooled. I figured him a friend. Yuri paused, watching the reactions of the masses gathered in the General Assembly. Despite what we may have thought about General Stepanov, the fact is that he had too much power in this position, something we failed to recognize until it was far too late. Yuri made eye contact with all his companions. His next words would shape the future of the territory. We cannot risk this ever happening again. Yuri strained out the papers on the desk. All evidence used against Stepanov. I recommend the total obliteration of the Black Army in its current form. Yuri looked out into the silent jury. The people exchanged glances. What, what, what he was saying, the people said through their eyes. I don't know. Others responded with a shake of the head, but it doesn't sound good. Companion Gellin scoffed, tapped on the table as he waited. He scoffed to himself. Usually, he can never quiet them down, but when, now, when he needs them to speak, they won't? Finally, the young man rose from his seat, adjusted his hat, and spoke in a shaky voice. You're not calling for the death of the men and women who have volunteered to protect us, are you, Companion Gellin scoffed. Yuri stared deep into the eyes of the boy and answered without blinking. I've always called for the death of the state companion. The quiet general simply erupted into chaos as it always did. Yuri beat his hand on the table, calling for the hauled order. What should we do then? Let them build power or wait for them to take control of the territory? The room, though divided into many camps, seemed to agree on one proposal. Allowing the Black Army to redeem itself through labor. Yuri considered other people's decision, but also thought of his concern. <clears throat> How many more Stepanovs hid in the Black Army? He took a deep breath and responded, giving his verdict. As the people command, Yuri acts to defend Russia. We must remove all avenues of power. Having brought the General Assembly a list of several hundred of the worst offenders in the Black Army, those who abuse their power by demanding tribute from communes, threatening military force against innocents, and even inciting violence on some occasions, we demanded justice. We expect that their crimes would be repaid, preferably through the firing squad, but the General Assembly has given us a different response. They argue that killing these men was amoral and would set a bad precedent. Galenskov agreed. So far, from here on out, these men will be serving as an unpaid laborer in the Free Territory, doing all the manual work needed in the army. Man, we have no PP, do we? How far to go? We have made great progress in dismantling the status structure and removing those who would move us in the direction of a state. Yet there still remains a great question on what to do with the Security Council. It's certainly the logical step to take one if wishes if to take if one wishes to completely and totally abolish any trace of government. However, the Security Council offers a lot of benefits and we shouldn't be so quick to dismantle it. Though we loathe to admit it, the apparatus is great for organizing the army and making tough decisions when it's warranted. Destroying it may hurt the safety of the free territory, yet if we don't destroy it, can we truly consider ourselves anarchists? This is painful. Oh, the deficit. Ugh. As you command, Erushuka wringed her hands, her head resting against the frozen steel frame of the vehicle. She didn't know how much or much about Magadan. She had never been, in truth, she had only heard of it in passing. She knew it was a port city, former home of some, Russia's, some of Russia's worst. She would have loved to go had it been on her, on her accord. She wanted to see the ocean so terribly, it was something Pietro mentioned time and time again. The way the waves struggled against the frozen layer above it. Pietro, the foolish boy, his grin stretching from ear to ear, who was so proud to clear proclaimed that it was a perfect analogy for the anarchist struggle. Stepanov never visited the Far East, as a matter of fact, he dreaded it. He mentioned it to Eranushka many times while she escorted him from the commune to commune. He didn't come to Siberia on his own will, but found Tomsk to be quite enjoyable enough to make offhanded comments about how he thought that about having to invade the Far East made him nauseous. What he never mentioned was a coup, something Eranushka reiterated to the assembly more times than she could count. They didn't care. They had the nerve to look her in the face and tell her it was for her own good. The vehicle stopped abruptly, smacking Eranushka's head against the steel. She winced in pain, but not yelp. She not said a word since they took Pieter. If this was the people's will, so be it. She wasn't a people then, she supposed. The door behind her slid open. Two men stood there, many more behind them with guns. They said something about Magadan, about liberation, about work. Eranushka simply her smile just behind one of the men she could see the ocean. What's more freezing or freeing than the wild water? Okay. 
Resource efficiency gain output. Oh, oh wow, that hurts our libertarian socialism, huh? And we get 0.26 every day. Jesus, this is so bad. Dissolve the Security Council. Uh, Citizen's Army. Ooh. Uh, power the General Assembly. Oh, we yeah, have this too. Hold on. Um, let's grab this one too. Army professionalism. More libertarian socialism. Taking pause. I'm not done, Yevgenium. Yuri cut deep into his vi venison. He sawed off a piece of the steak and plopped it into his mouth. He let his elbows rest on the table, arms erect, fork in one hand, and the knife in the other. I know Yuri Yevgenia Tarotuta said somberly, toying with her side dish. He spun his utensils in the air as he chewed. With a gulp, Yuri spoke once more. You know, Yevgenia, I prefer to eat with guests. She nodded. I invited Stepanov to my own home so many times. He sat right where you did. He ate my food and looked into my eyes. He called, him my, called himself my friend. Yevgenia sat down her fork and looked to her friend with pleading eyes. Yuri, no, Yevgenia, let me finish. He told me he knew how to eliminate our enemies, and we sat here and drafted our plans. Yuri thrusted his fork into the table. He looked at me and told me what to do, and I did it. Yuri grabbed Yevgenia's trembling hand. Tell me what I need to do. I feel as if the Security Council will be the thing to haunt me for years to come. Should I rid myself of the guilt or and dissolve it, or should I work within it? Tell me, Yevgenia, I can't do this alone. Do what your heart tells you to do. Crap. Uh... Hmm. Or dissolve the Security Council. I don't want to lose organization. Hmm. I like this one because it gives you more libertarian socialism. Which makes more sense. But we're going to probably go dissolve the Security Council. The Council has always been, always been a tool of the state, and one through which Stepanov exerted his vile control over the nation and launched his coup. If we wish to ensure that such a thing never happens again, the institution must be abolished. Additionally, as long as the Council existed, the free territory was always in danger of creeping authoritarianism. While the anarchist ideology might be secured today, over the course of several years it might be eroded away by opportunistic generals in the Council until control over the nation was securely in their hands. Such a thing must be prevented. Less division, uh, less doctrine, research speed, and division organization. We get more war support, less attrition, and better division, attack, and defense on core territory. Oh, uh, I feel bad about this one, maybe. We'll see what happens. Oof. Nice. After this, our attachment to liberty. Ooh, academic base. I want to do harnessing the ultimate deterrent, though. What we've achieved here is truly incredible. Regardless of the end result, we've managed to mobilize the resources of hundreds of communes without the need for an oppressive overhead government. We have proven that an anarchist society is not only possible, but functional. No longer can anyone say that an anarchist society can not organize itself enough to become a threat. Even if our nuclear stockpile never matches the likes of Germany and Japan, the fact that we can possess an, uh, or pose an organizational military threat may be enough to protect us. Pack up and leave. The Security Council was never meant to last longer than the emergency was over, until the eminent threat of the end of freedom was gone, and here it was, festering years later, and even after the liberation of Siberia, they had held onto power, turning into an association of status and counter-revolutionaries. It was time that it would be abolished for good. No longer would the Black Army be at the beck and call of officials that could no could not be held accountable for their actions, before they could get some sort of kind of coup against Galenskov and get themselves killed. Nobody would object. It was obvious that their time in the spotlight had come to an end. Now the Black Army would serve our companions. Assembled men, assembly men and women, I motion for the immediate abolishment of the Security Council. It has served its purpose and its members have been loyal, but no longer must we have a central organization commanding such a powerful army. The assembly nodded in agreement. All in favor, the vast majority of hands went up. I think this is settled then. Easy as that. Alright, so that's not too bad. Starting from scratch. Okay, it will be removed by February, which is, thank goodness, these, these guys are still killing, are they killing each other at all? Maybe not. They're supposed to be, but... Both sides have no manpower, and Yeltsin has more uh, factories. These have guys have more... Fa oh, divisions, though. Wow. Um, let's get some better artillery. Oh, crap. We're out of civ... Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so we got some of this stuff. Okay, that's good. Wow, we have built like crazy. The Severian plan, or legacy of the Severian plan, could be completely 100% like overpowered if you know how to use it right. Because, holy crap, we are doing well with this. We are building so much. And don't get me wrong, I love it, but... Eventually, we're going to run out of things to build. Maybe except for forts. Maybe we'll have to build forts then. Anti-air? Sure. Here you go. Have some anti-air. Oh, it's paused. My bad. 
our attachment to liberty. If we wish to remain a free people in the East or the Free Territory, we must be prepared to deal with those who would take away our freedom. For there are numerous warlords on every border which seek to oppress us. For there are none like us, and beyond them lie even greater threats in Germany, Japan, well, whose terrible might can be seen in Moscow and Beijing today. Every man and woman should be prepared to take up arms in defense of our way of life, should the situation demand it. For should they not, we will surely be lost. If you'd like to read about better research facilities, please go right ahead. We get more research speed. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Four days left, not bad. Pretty good. And we will get that stuff done. Nice, nice, nice. More tanks, please. Yes, please. We have 110 political power, which I like. And sackers. Uh, I guess you can do Germany. It doesn't really matter, honestly. There you go. Don't want to be bothered with that again. Economy department. Nice. So, I still want to integrate the rest of the places here first. But we're going to go ahead and grab the communes and try to support people who want to support us. And we're going to do one, two, three, because we can. Konsk? Weapons? They shall have it. Krasnoyarsk? Reinforcements? They shall have it. Kemerovo? Supplies? Yes. Irkutsk? Weapons? Yes. We have six versus nine. Can be convinced? No. Gondo Atask? No. Novosibirsk? Economic autonomy? So be it. Seven? We need one more. One more. Supplies? Yes. So, 8 versus 7? Good. I love democracy. 1.33? Not good. Not good. Especially as we want to make these guys even thicker. Screw it. We're going to go 40s. All you guys. Screw it. We're going to go 40s completely. Now, our budget is going to be expanded. 1.33 is probably going to jump up. Maybe. We'll see what happens. The deliberations of a man with everything. Dr. Drogov carelessly dropped his bags next to him. There it was, a shame, beautiful, shimmering sea, and somewhere far beyond it sat a city on a hill, a place where men could be free and civil, not just one or the other. It didn't matter now, whatever led to the fragmentation of Russia and the rise of anarchy, the question was easier asked than answered, so Dr. Drogov simply didn't. He'd be more than content to abort a boat and leave this menace behind, but I'd figured you'd I'd find you here, came Miss Drogova from behind. She was not Dr. Dr Drogova or Miss Drogova, no, she fancied herself Drogova the Free, the anarchist. Dr. Drogova nodded, still facing out to the sea. You've come to join me, Natalia, like heck. Dr. Drogov chuckled. I figured as much. The pair stood in silence for some time. A daughter watching her father's back. A whistle blew in the distance, breaking the silence. I should be going. You should. Where did you come, Natalia? To mock me? To see me off? Dr. Drugov, uh, Drogov whipped around in rage, facing his daughter. She was not smirking or attempting to hide a laugh. Instead, tears ran down the young woman's face. Dr. Drogov stepped to console his daughter, but she recoiled back, sipping away from him. Her father opened his mouth to say something, anything he could, but was cut off by yet another blast of the whistle. He looked to his daughter and back to the sea. Dr. Drugov collected his bags and made for the dock. Stability and libertarian socialism? Yes, please. Make his message clear. Our message clear. Despite our best efforts, most people still don't really know what anarchism is. Most of our citizens can't even bring themselves to think of lands any farther than those immediately bordering the communes. This is something that has become rapidly apparent to Galenskov, as he has spoken with more and more residents of the Free Territory, inspired by the ignorance he's witnessed. He has written and published a book with his views and the opinions of those others of anarchism and what it actually is in the Free Territory, in the hopes of making the ideology more clear to the average reader. Prepare for the Unification War. Oh. Um... I, mean, I suppose we could. Why not? Probably get a little vent. We get some preparation. We're going to show down the final conflict. I mean, I'm not going to go to war anytime soon, so... I mean, I guess we could have tried to peacefully unify that. Actually, would make a little bit of sense, but... Oh, well, it is what it is. We will stand shoulder to shoulder. Freedom must be protected. Room for improvement. Adrian hugged his books close to his chest as he wandered aimlessly around the campus alone. Okay, 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 okay. He wasn't alone. He was in a group, yes. How stupid of him to get lost. How could one not succeed at walking in a straight line? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Adrian slapped his palm against his forehead. Now that they were already deep within the college, and he was lost in the courtyard. God help him, he had only been here for 20 minutes and already messed up everything else. Or messed up everything, as usual. Adrian quickened his pace, first man in his family to go to college, and he was already making a mockery of his family. What was he going to tell his mother, that he got lost and they sent him here at home? He never... While rounding a corner, he co coiled 
or collided, probably, with something sending Adrian's books hurling to the ground with a thud. I'm so sorry, he said, scrolling together his things. The woman he ran into only left, massaging his, her arm. You're in a hurry by the looks of it. Here, let me help you. She bent down to the ground, collecting the scattered books. I'm sorry, I should have been looking where I was going. I just got, got separated from the group, she interjected. The flush, Adrian nodded. I figured, don't worry, you're not the first. This place is huge. I'm Anastasia, but my friends call me Anna. Nice to meet you. She extended a hand to the young man before her. Adrian wiped his sweaty palm on his pants. Hi, Anastasia, I'm Adrian. She found the scene funny. Well, Adrian, why don't I show you around? Young friendship between young minds. We shall stand shoulder to shoulder. Hmm. Libertarian socialism finding its footing, or freedom must be protected. Well, you're going to lose libertarian socialism here, so. The SBA fell apart because the communists were too distracted from their own problems and politics. Yeah. So, we gotta go with the wheel stand shoulder to shoulder. Your commune is your home, and your communes around you are your neighbors. One should always remember that your, their fellow citizens in the free territory are anarchists just like them, and shouldn't ever be seen as the enemy, regardless of race, religion, or anything else. Instead, the average citizen should turn his attention to the General Assembly. Though it, it is an apparatus through which all citizens are to be represented, such power could easily be abused if a party or a coalition gained too many seats. Watch for the state of, or the enemy of statism, not your fellow man. Nice. Oh, we can do all this stuff too. Uh, well, it says we can establish, infiltrate Russian institutions, prepare for production war. Um, convince eight seven. Give even more political power, please. Oh yeah, we can do this too. Stuff too. That's fine. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Just go and do this. All the stuff. Nice. I'm just prepared for whoever wants to kill each other off. Or we just go barreling in on everybody, so. That sounds like fun. Wow, widespread coronism, minus 5.5 .5 a month. Holy bad words. Well, we need to improve that. Lessons from Stepanov's coup, cool, though. It's been a long road to get where we are today. It's almost been a decade since the Siberian Free Territory came into existence, and almost two since we fled east during the Second World War. And yet, only a few months since Stepanov's coup changed us yet again forever. The world is changing so rapidly, and yet it feels like Russia and the people within haven't changed at all. Discounting the bitterness of so many now feel, all we can do is hope or continue to try to learn and trying to adapt to this new strange world. Finding his footing, Yuri Galinskov, shadowed by a larger entourage of his closest companions, strode down the street if one could even call the dirt path such a thing. You're probably wondering why I've dragged you out here. Valentiev told me I needed to get out more. Yuri began to chuckle before even completing his tale. That, I was losing touch, so here we are. He threw his arms in the air, like I normally do. Yuri knocked on the door to the decrepit shack three times and placed his hand on his hip. Hip, hip, hip. He waited his cleek crowding the rickety porch, wooden porch. No answer came. Yuri knocked again, this time harder. No response with a sigh. He turned around to depart when this door to the hovel swung open. Who the bad word are you? The man's wa eyes widened. Companion Galenskov? What are you doing here? The kind of greeting got a hearty laugh out of Yuri, who turned back to the door and extending his hand to the man. Spoken like a true Russian, good evening, companion. I hope we didn't disturb you. The bewildered elderly man shook his head as he stammered out an answer. No, 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 no. I was, just wasn't expecting someone like you to be here tonight. Yuri rose his eyebrow. A man such as myself, companion. I'm only a man myself. I have contributed no more to this territory than you have. Perhaps, and however, I always strive to do all that I can for this community. So tell me, Yuri smiled. The first genuine one in some time. What can I do for you? Well, you can start by coming inside. I've got food on the stove. And now we have advanced artillery finally researched. Even though we weren't really, really expecting it too much, but now we've got really, really good artillery, don't we? And actually, we could probably start cutting the construction budget, but stepping, taking a step back. Yuri, you cannot be serious. You have getting bellowed following behind Galenskov as he marched down the halls of the General Assembly. Valentiev was not far behind. Yuri continued to walk briskly to the main meeting room of the assembly, his oversized coat almost flying off of him as he marched to his destination. I'm not doing this to spite you, Evgenia. This is a decision long in the making, not simply on a whim. I've always been weary of the General Assembly. Nothing is to stop another step enough from arising. Valentiv hastened his pace and stopped in front of Yuri, grabbing him by the shoulders. Companion Galenskov, I cannot let you do this. I understand where you are coming from, but I can assure you that devolving power further down is not going to make it so anyone's life any easier. The General Assembly is fine as it is. Yuri shrugged Valentiev's hands off of him, began to formulate a retort, but Vevgenia raced next to Valentiev and put her hands on his chest. Yuri, please, I know you're just trying to do what you think is right, but consider the implications before you act. This will make assisting those who need it even more harder. Uh, Yuri took a step back, letting his friend's hands fall down to her sides. He furrowed his brow and stared at the pair before him. The General Assembly was too powerful for its own good, but maybe they posed a solid argument. Yuri shifted his weight, troubled by the conundrum. I will fight against Yuri no matter where. 
You may be right, companions, but I am weary. So there's no such thing as harmless power. Let me get more libertarian socialism. Daily... Oh, God. Political power goes down further. Oh, no. Uh, consumer goods factories, construction speed. Just the bare minimum. That doesn't sound very libertarian so uh, socialist of us, now does it? I'm sorry, but I've got to go. There's no such thing as harmless power. Though the General Assembly was founded with the, only the best intentions, our de facto leader, Yuri Galinskov, has come to the conclusion that the organization has too many potential to oppress. Or too has a potential to oppress. The vote of the smaller, more rural, and the General Assembly has a potential to override the larger, more urbanized communes. Their interests are taking precedence over those of others, something that is quite unacceptable if we are to continue calling ourselves anarchists. The General Council will now be run directly by popular vote, and the communes will be granted even more independence. Uh, let's go ahead and do finish that one, and now we can figure out what this stuff is about. Let's do this one top. Cool, in five days we'll have something interesting to read. Love it! Because I was actually told in the comments that we should do this, go down this route, and uh, we got a lot of resources. Holy crap, I love Russia. But, um, like, figure out, like, uh, nuclear stuff. Also, there was one comment saying that I should play as Cheetah as well, so I will, I promise. I'll, we will get there someday. I will play as Cheetah, I just don't know when. <laughs> There's just so there's too there's there's too many mods for me to play and too many things and too many people. Err. Uh, land force, why not? Uh, we fifty-three political power. Uh, Norals next. Seek your not your fortune in the dark dreary mine. Once we get this next one done as well, my apologies. <clears throat> Watch your head. The guy took Yuri Galinskov deeper into the mine shaft of Yahudinsk. I think we have the morning shift on duty, duty still, though we're going to be heading to lunch soon. Well, if we can, I'd like to get some chance to see them as they work. For this project to be a success, I'm going to need to know about the ins and outs of the miners' thought process and how they go about their daily lives. The foreman shook his head from side to side in contemplation. I think we can arrange that, but probably won't even notice you coming in. The work we do here is some of the hardest you'll see across the entirety of Russia, he chuckled. Let me see here. Ah, there's Dmitri. I think you'd be the best one to ask. He's one of the more educated of the bunch here. Dmitri, get your butt over here! The man sat down his pickaxe and took off his hard hat, using it to fan himself. Something I can do for you? Dimitri, this is Companion Gelenskov. You know him. He's looking for some information on a certain project. Yuri. Nice to meet you, Companion Mikhail. The pair shook hands. I need your help. This free territory needs your help. During this, the mining process, what do you consider the most important part of gathering uranium? Making sure you have lead-laced clothing. Oh. Uranium, go for plutonium. Oh. And he's, look how happy you are. They have thumbs up. Oh, I love it. Uranium, go for plutonium. I'm gonna go for. Oh, actually, where are we with this? Because right now, like, expertise, we're an innovative industry. We're already maxed out. Holy! Well, I wasn't even trying to do this one that much. So, factory complexes would be nice. For we're here, so we got to go with equipment. So, cool. That's actually really, really awesome. I suppose at this point, like I said earlier, we could probably start cutting things down. Maybe unless ah no 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 no. There you go. Yeah, we can start cutting stuff down a little bit. Our construction budget is probably pretty high. Uh, let's see. It is over 8 billion. Nice. Science on top of the world. Yuri stomped on the floor of Matt as he entered the home, kicking the snow off his boots. Not that it did very much. The snow of Norals came close to completely enveloping him entirely. His pant legs were frozen stiff, making walking quite awkward. He waddled over to the large reclining chair next to the fireplace and sat. You had the fire going already? Yuri called out as the older man embedded him out, went for the kettle. I figured you want to warm up. Most people aren't prepared for the cold, he said, pouring into the kettle. Plus, with a topic I wish to discuss, I want to make sure you're firing on all cylinders. I don't know if you know, but your ability to make rational decisions is hampered by the cold. Really, Yuri said, removing his gloves. No, I didn't know that. Where did you learn that? I studied in the Academy of Sciences before the world went to heck in a handbasket. He laughed, scratching at the whiskers. A college friend of mine, what was his name? I couldn't remember for the life of me. He studied agriculture. <clears throat> it was his big thing, and he mentioned it to me one time. Regardless... And that's not what I wanted to tell you. What I need to tell you is that this nuclear weapon must be kept in total secret during its construction. Letting any information slip on it could have dire consequences. It's a people's project. I cannot hide it from them. Of course, who knows what the sabotage the status have planned. Nope. That's where we gotta go. Visit the Krasnoyarsk commune. Yes, please. Implementing a motion. We got more political power from this stuff, which is nice. And we're pretty much done with that one. Nice. And we're done. There's no such thing as harmless power. And now, we're, we're out of focuses. On your own in the wind. Sergei bounded his foot against the rotting wood and floor. He grimaced, looking out of the window. The window by the fireplace, of course. Outside, snow fell like tears from a weeping god. Perhaps god was brought to tears by the past 20 years. Could he blame him? Sergei knew his god was not only 
all-powerful, but also a caring God, who one who wanted each and every one of his children not only survive, but thrive. Certainly, no people had suffered more than those who traversed life hand in hand with God. Even if God was enraged or mournful, whatever, his frozen tears did little to help. This storm was terrible. The whole house could be buried. Best not to think about it. Sega shut the blinds and turned around, and another, another storm was brewing. One inside his own house. Sergei's wife cradled his youngest son while his oldest fiddled with the radio, a second son sitting adjacent. They had called out for relief hours ago, but no single king signal came. Sergei added another log to the fire just to distract himself. Sergei's oldest son threw the headphones off his head. Nobody's listening. There's no point in this. The young man marched off to the corner of his room. Sergei's wife shot him a worried look. Even if his son was overreacting, the prospecting of being trapped in the wilderness with three boys was horrifying. As if on cue, the radio crackled to life. Sergei, did you call for help? I'm near. Sergei. Where are you, Sergei? Grandpa? Oh, Sergei. All on board! Yuri rested his briefcase on his lap as he looked out the train's window. Novosibirsk to Krasnoyarsk was one of the most popular journeys on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Occasionally, some families would board just for the enjoyment to celebrate a wedding or a birthday. He couldn't blame them. People gave Siberia a bad rep as a barren wasteland, but there were so many hidden treasures to be found. Yuri retrieved a pen and paper from the briefcase and began to sketch a scene of the car he was in. He wasn't good at art, but was getting better. Can I offer you some drinks, companion? A stewardess cheerfully asked from behind. Yuri startled, dropped his pen narrowly, caught his journal in between his legs. I'm so sorry, the woman laughed. I didn't mean to. Yuri found the humor as well. No worries. Paper doesn't shatter like glass, thankfully. Yuri looked at the brown-haired woman. Her eyes are similar brown. Where are you from? She tucked her hair behind her ear. Chris Neuer, my father operates a shop in the marketplace. What can you tell me about transporting goods on these trains? Avoid the Kemerovo Junction. It's beyond repair. Make two of them. Put two. Put them on two trains. I like losing less political power. Ooh, that does not feel good. Losing political power. No, 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 no. Uh, hey, look at that. We'll keep slashing some more. Because right... Oh, my God. Union boys will win the battles. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 points something. 13. My goodness. Regardless, I have to say, companion, I am quite impressed. What you have accomplished here outshines some of your most industrialized contemporaries. Yuri said as he toured the factory, overflowing with men slamming away hammers on the sheets of metal. Oh, come on, companion Galenskov, said the leader of the commune's largest union. We are humble folks here, really. No, Yuri stopped and distracts the realization coming to himself. This could further the nuclear effort by years beyond our initial estimates. You must devote your entire willpower to the furtherment of the project. The union boss tossed his head from side to side in contemplation. Well, I suppose I could try and convince them, but they aren't exactly eager to make weapons of war here. If I were to convince them, they'd have stipulations. They would want the magnitude of the weapon limited, and a promise that it would never be used. It must be only for show. I suppose I can be arranged. No dice. Mm. Uh. This is what the people want. And, this is, and that is what the people will get. <clears throat> that being said, I think the next one we'll do again is empower the communes because we we have infinite stability at this point, like billions. Oh wait, we lose. Oh, because I'll I'll Monty. And look at that manpower, Jesus Christ! And currently we're getting one political power every day, so that's not too bad. Uh, uh okay, so we got to empower the communes, and I'm going immediately for an army professionalism because uh, I can't deal with that. I can't deal with all that red, despite how good we're, we've done so far. But it is March 1971, which means we got rid of the debuffs for our army hopefully for the most part citizens army sure whatever earning the liberation you bet they're gonna earn it communal s s research nice disdain for tyrants nice fighting to prove a point you betcha chet you betcha look at that we're cutting down the debt a little bit i mean we're completely done with the focus tree which is awesome I this has been a really fun campaign the libsoc or libertarian socialist paths are usually pretty fun uh, they might be slightly biased, maybe, but, you know, every campaign ideology is probably biased in some way, so I don't really care too much. It's a lot of fun. This campaign is a load of fun, and I'd be interested to see what the despotist or army route is like uh, when we get there as well. So, next one, the Shah of Iran was assassinated, an uncertain future ahead. How do you guys, seriously, how many divisions do these guys have? Guys, Boris, 37, they're not touching each other. Do I have to come in and touch both of you? I keep saying touch for some weird reason. Don't ask me why. Don't don't ask me why. Let's not go there. But all right, so we got all the artillery done. We need better tanks too. So nice, very good. And we need this uh, done as well. Nice, very good. 
Okay, we must record the other place because now we have almost we have roughly nine hundred thousand manpower. The Iranian civil war, the Persian power gave the close at last. Very nice. And now we're gonna go do some more communes just because I think we need to. Six. What do you want? Funding? Sure. Krasnoyarsk wants can be convinced. No. The supplies? Sure. Eight versus seven. Now we have to wait literally two months for this to get done, which is totally okay. In two months' time, these guys probably won't, won't still kill each other. But we should have enough political power at least to do this as well. Visit the Yakutsk Commune or Gorno Atayisk, Novosibirsk, Magadan, or Tomsk. Now, of course, we could just go ahead and do this one, but gain base war support. That doesn't seem really good. I guess we could do that one, though. Sure, why not? Regional integration. Um, there's nothing else here. I mean, we're looking. I mean, this is really good. We've almost reunified all of Russia, which I love. Or the former Soviet Union territory, so. Alright, up next we'll probably do Yakutsk Commune. Once we get enough political power, we get 1.18. That's really bad. That's really bad. Wow. Uh, but that's alright. That is totally okay. And we'll get that done in five days, which is nice. Cut down some of the debt. Barely, but we're still cutting it down. The second night of the long knives. Decrease the poverty. Yes! If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. I love decreasing poverty. A toast for economists. Now we have a 10 to 15 percent poverty rate. We were beginning in this campaign, 50 to 80 percent, but now we're at 10 to 15. I love libertarian socialism. Oh, good. All right. Nice. All right. Safety first. Companions, young and old, stand up now to protect our hardest workers. A man shouted from the bullhorn outside the Yakutsk City Hall, standing atop a box of fish brought west from Magadan. Mishirenko rolled his eyes as he walked past the protesters. Yuri Galinskov at his side. Whatever, he spat. Those on the project not only volunteer, but already enjoy some of the best amenities we can offer. They're always pushed for more of these people. We free them from occupation, offer them liberty, and their own autonomy. And what do they do? They complain. Mishirenko shook his head. I'm sorry that you have to see this, Companion Galinskov. This isn't the reason we came today. Yuri watched the crowd as he walked past. He looked at his watch. He was supposed to be meeting with some some holdouts from the previous regime who were willing to meet after an intense siege. Oh, come on along now. They're simply exercising their right to protest. Yeah, well, I wish it exercise their right to be quiet as well. Mishirenko said with a huff. Here's the vehicle companion, Galenskov. Go ahead. Yuri was still watching the protests. Maybe they had a point. Was there still more to it? No, surely not. However, even if there was the smallest chance there was, maybe it was worth it. I will catch up with you. I, I have to be here. I have to be here for this. And we could... 1.1. Oh, 1. 1. If we did this, some more... I mean, that's 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 really nice, actually. That's really, really nice. So we did that. We can only get 1.18. 1. 1. We got 0. 0.1 more. That's not super worth it. Not going to lie. Let's grab that. Let's grab some of this, too. Convincing. And then we... Oh, look at, look at all the stuff we're building. My goodness. My, my goodness. Well, uh, with a poverty rate, though, that's just so much better. And now, I knew we could get at least another one done. 4.5. That's still a lot. Now, we're only at this one. I would love to go here or go here, but the income tax rate doesn't change too much. And taxable population factor doesn't change at all. Less than 5% poverty. I've never, I don't think I've ever gone that way. So, not bad. I'm really disappointed these guys aren't killing each other anymore, though. That's really sucky. That is really, really sucky. Next one up is not bad. Are we still doing this? No, we're not. We should do that, probably. Passive defense. Good. Sweep westwards? I mean, we could, but we will do that later on. We can go to war with both of them. Nah. I want to get some bigger armies first. And the Novosibirsk commune. Shall we? Yes, we shall. Over 100 billion in GDP. I love it. Oh, and then we can do d Desperate Times. People's tribunals found them guilty on all accounts. Exploitation, murder, theft, the whole nine yards. Didn't have to kill them, though. I'm sure that's pretty par for the course for you. The man said with a laugh, you you see worse guys than we do all the time. You know, they were little fascist Saudis. Crazy. The man unclipped the ring of keys from his belt and searched for the right one. Anyways, these guys basically were chomping at the bit for their opportunity to redeem themselves in the people's eyes. He said in air quotes. Sounds like desperate BS to me, but what do I know? 
Yuri stepped into the prison cell. The two men sat at a wooden table, playing just ilk of the state, Yuri said coldly. Both men quickly shut up from their seats, bumping the table and ruining the perfectly good game of chess. Companion Gelonskov, thank God you have come. We are so terribly sorry. My assistant and I have been journaling for years in the cell, riding away. As you should, Yuri said, crossing his arms. I understand your convictions, and our time in turn has shown us the way as well. As a gesture of goodwill, I offer you all our notes from the previous position in the State University, along with our countless notes and theories of sense. The man thrusted a notebook into Yuri's hands. Please take this and let us go. Get out of here and tell no one. This is a people's mission. Libertarian Socialism all the way, my friends. And we'll have that one done next to And then Gorno Altaisk Commune. I'm purposely delaying re reunifying this because I want to see what happens here. Another old day older and deeper in debt. Hey, are you talking about me? You see, the miner's words muffled by the, his mouth full of food. I know a guy who knew a guy who was there when they evap evaporated that American island. It took a gulp from the large cup of carbonated soft drink. Guy was a total nut. The workman belched. Anyways, this guy I know went way back west. I haven't heard from him in a few years now, but he was super obsessed with nuclear weaponry and all that entailed. He left me with this list of materials and even planned out a quarry. Yuri's face crinkled in disgust. If the project wasn't of the utmost importance, he most certainly would have been anywhere else in Russia than this. I appreciate you stepping forward with this information, companion. You're furthering a very noble cause. The miner reclined in a seat. Well, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't remember saying anything about handling handling it over. There's got to be a little something in it for me too, right? Yuri scowled. Greed does not look good on you, companion. I highly suggest you drop this little charade. Oh, come on, Yuri. Yuri's face remained a straight line. Fine, you can poop in one hand and then put your ideology in the other and see what fills up faster. The man erupted from a seat. Well, wait, let's just talk this up. Go and consider a bath too. <laughs> Why do you pain us so, Yuri? Anyways, we have the light of the Lord. What was more tranquil than strolling around the evening's market to Yuri Galenskov? There wasn't anything he'd rather do. He happened to be in Gorno Altaisk for a meeting with a commune regarding the peaceful transitions from the previous administration. Yuri found the people quite agreeable, and a little conservative for his tastes. His tastes were occupied elsewhere, however, as he bit into the reindeer jerky. His mouth was overwhelmed with flavor from the well-seasoned and perfectly cooked snack. He relaxed on one of the benches, closing his eyes and simply soaking in the environment, and then the screaming started, Don't not test his might. He is watching do what is right. God is the only one who can pass judgment. Yuri opened his eyes to see men in robes holding signs depicting nuclear explosions inside of a large circle with a line through it. Yuri rubbed his eyes in exhaustion. God can stick it where the sun don't shine. It's never too late to find religion. That's true. But with the route we've gone, we've got to go that way, my friends. Not a matter of why, but why not? For all his time spent speaking to the people, ranting and raving about the movement he propelled from the past to the forefront of geopolitics, sometimes Yuri enjoyed just to listen. Listening was how he first learned of anarchy, after all. There would be plenty to learn from the bright minds of the newly minted Tomsk Enrichment Center. Greetings, scientists, war heroes, and diplomats alike. I am C. Ivanov. No, the C doesn't stand for a companion. It stands for the presentation, companion Ivanov? The brown-haired woman to his left said, or asked, Apologies, companions. That's my lovely assistant, Carolina. She's the brains of this operation. Don't let her tell you otherwise. Ivanov laughed, placing a hand on his assistant's shoulder. Now, growing up, I heard a lot about pe a lot of people tell me, "You are wasting your time, and you will never succeed." Today, we will prove them wrong. Today, we will make them eat those words. We got inspired. I don't want these darn words. I want action. My action is blowing up. Your gosh darn house, Ivanov roared. Yuri watched from the audience, mute in shock. Was this man out of his mind? His ego was certainly collecting rocks on the moon with uh, how out of this world it was. On the other hand, maybe that's what this project needed. A real passion? Yuri opened his mouth to speak and said, Carolina, get your boss under control. To greatness, Captain Ivanov. Begin to improve or slowly improve? Ooh, which one do we want? Uh, to greatness. To greatness. And I think I've spent enough time here. I think we've done enough. So in about a month, we can sweep westwards, have a good time, and just kill all of our enemies off. I mean, I, th I think it's just time for us to uh, get started on this, shall we? So we're doing pretty darn well. We've done as much as we can. There's no way we can get rid of this massive decrease in minus 5.5. I mean, primary schooling is going up. We've got, uh, what else do we have? Research facilities going up. We've got agriculture going up, even though we've already passed it. Poverty rate's not too bad. Industrial equipment's pretty good. Industrial experts is going pretty darn well. But I suppose we can do one more. And over here, if you look at each one of these, there's no more for army professionalism, which really kind of sucks. But I totally understand why. So it is what it is. And that was literally just our last one to do in terms of rock nuclear bombs and rocketry. Poverty rate looks pretty good to me. 
Um, actually, where are we on industrial equipment? Uh, that's expertise. Equipment, we are on factory complexes. And it's slowly going up by 7 a month, which is not bad. I guess we'll do that one next. Equipment, expand civilian infrastructure. Why not? It's not great, but not bad. Alright, so we got four communes versus our 11. Political autonomy, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Cross Norris, can be convinced? Nope. 10 to 2 about military training? Sure, 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 sure. 6 versus 9. Gordon Altaisk, weapons, they shall have it. As well as Nova Sibirsk. Funding, so there's 8 versus 7. I love it. Love it, love it, love it. The Far East really doesn't support it, but Central Siberia does. I'm glad we, that these guys are still killing each other off, so this way we can just, like, do whatever we want for the most part. We have a total of 39 divisions. Now, these guys have a lot on their own front. They have 31. And then these guys have 27. Manpower-wise, they have 0. They have 0. And we've got a war with all of them. And they have no equipment as well. Look at that. Well, they have some equipment. Not a whole lot of it, though. And these guys, pretty much the same thing. Not a lot of equipment. So this should go fairly okay for us. So we'll see what happens. Cut that down. I've already cut construction spending all the way down to the bottom. Minus 15 billion a year is pretty darn nice, I would say. Go on in, my friends. Oh, is there capital right here? No, it's not. Okay. Eight, over 800,000. Can four tanky boys take out all of our enemies? Maybe. Logistics 2. We killed 13,000 of the Soviets off. That's nice. Let's grab some more of this, just because we can. Nice. Let's grab some more of this. More soft attack and piercing. Cool. And I want to raise uh, military spending just because we're at war, so. Nice. Good job, boys. Keep going. Keep going. Who could win? Our four tanks or the 35 infantry divisions? Who could take out which nation faster? That is the real question here. Let's see. We've lost 1,000 versus 40,000. Not bad so far. Not bad. These guys are on trickle. I kind of like it. These guys are just moving so fast. I love it. So good. Oh, rip them a new one, guys. Go, go, go. Oh, we have five? Look at that. Now we have five tank divisions. Very nice. These, these... This is what capitalism does for Western Siberian Republic and authoritarian socialism for the Soviet Federation of Western Russia. Both hardcore authoritarian communism always fails as well as capitalism. Always. Always fails. Oh, I, I forgot to do, like, research, like, the research speed stuff, so... Now we're doing it! Svedlosk? Oh, hello, Svedlosk. Well, how many have we killed? Almost 50,000 each. I have a feeling these guys are gonna capitulate. Yep, they're gonna capitulate first. Thank you. <laughs> this is ridiculously easy, I'll be honest. This, I'm very surprised how easy this turned out to be. Well, maybe a little disappointed, actually. Oh, wait, we had that stuff, too. Oh, whoops, I forgot. Um, Soviet, why not? This has been a fun campaign, I'll be honest. It's been a lot of fun. Should play as, a, play as him again sometime. And I'll just take you and head on up here. Somewhere else is it? Veliki Ustyug? Ustyug? I can't do anything there. Reunify the motherland? Yes, please. Mechanical com uh, computer ballistic stuff? Yes. Armor and breakthrough? Yes, please. Spending, cut it down. I mean, we're, look at that debt. Our GDP versus national debt. I love libertarian socialism. Oh, more divisions. Oh, it's more infantry. Oh, you're all, oh god, you're all the way over here. Oh, good lord. There you go. Good luck. And actually, can we start integrating some of these regions? Yes. Let's go and do, start doing that. Since we have no focus tree, so are we losing political power every day? 0.37 is not very good. And do we have the capital? Maybe, maybe not. Alright. How many divisions do they have left? 11. We've killed off 72,000 versus less than 600. I'm liking what we're seeing here. Less than 17 billion. anti grill activities. Very nice, very nice. Military austerity. Uh, Let's slash and spend. There we go. Something a little different than normal. Where are these tanks? I mean, they're just hopefully doing a great job. Just steamrolling right in. So we've lost 700 versus 76,000. Capitals are uncles probably. Yep, I called it. Where are my tanks? Why are you guys not doing anything? Why are you breaking my heart? Oh, 
Is that it? Yep, that's it. Oh, good lord, there's a lot of things we gotta reintegrate. That's fine. Reunify the blue line, my friends. Let's pause the game. Music. One nation under anarchy. During the warlord period, Russia experienced almost every government and ideology under the sun, but now an unexpected candidate overcame all opposition. Anarchism. From its humble beginnings as an unorganized militia in the backwater of Siberia, the Siberian Black Army grew who uh, grew in strength and size by defaulting or defeating all those who wanted to infringe the liberties of its people, and now find itself ruling a territory spawning from Onega to Kamchatka. Most observers believe that an anarchist government would not be able to bring stability to Russia, but let alone controlling a territory spanning two continents, but not only the Siberian Black Army brought peace to the Russians. It did so while staying true to its principles. A Russian free territory. As a truly egalitarian society where the peasants and the workers belong to themselves, free from any restrictions, all under the protection of the Black Army, seems like Mother Anarchy loves her sons. By the anarchist spirit, I mean that deeply human sentiment which aims for the good of all, freedom and justice for all, and solidarity and love amongst the people. Enrico Malatesta. No gods, no masters. And another research slot. And that should be it. So. And anything else? Is that not it or something? Do we have more after this? I mean, technically, we did take out the socialists. Uh, I mean, we can integrate stuff. The authoritarian socialists, of course. Vote yes. Oh, what's in a title? Bread Conquered. Yuri Galinskov scribbled the title out. He'd always felt a deep attachment to writing from a young age. Where did it come from? He couldn't answer. The way his pen danced across paper told him he was gifted and that writing was a calling of his. Yuri liked to think that if he wasn't a revolutionary, he would be an author or maybe a poet. He wasn't quite sure, though he wondered if one could separate ideology from poetry. Was not each poem, each story, an insight into the author? A window for others to peek inside of, but never to answer? Freedom has been found, the history of the Russian revolutionary movement. Yuri scribbled out yet another title. Therein laid his problem. Yuri had ideas swirling around in his mind, but struggled to assemble them to make himself make sense. How was he going to make himself make sense to others if he did not make sense to himself? Companionship. Companionship. Short and simple. The title seemed fitting. Yuri thought of the most influential works of the last century, the books that brought the world to its knees. Mein Kampf, Imperium, The Communist Manifesto. Three tremendously fun books. That's not what this book would be, no. Yuri's writing promised to extend a hand to the world and assist it in rising to its feet. Yuri put his pen to paper, spurned on by a sudden wave of inspiration. Words began to flow out of his pencil until the introduction was completed. Yuri read it back to himself. K-H-A, Lipsock.38.8. That's a great title. I love that title. Uh, and then so Desk approaches the new order. I hope you enjoyed this campaign, my friends. Like I said earlier, I quite did myself. We did really, really well. well look at that. 100, over 200 billion in GDP versus 16 billion, in which basically in a single year we'll be able to pay it all off. But if you enjoy this campaign, do consider leaving a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below. And I'll see you tomorrow in a different campaign, even though Italy is in the co prosperity sphere. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.